Okay, we're live. Um, hello, friends. Uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Since uh, 2013, we've been making high quality knowledge easily accessible and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. For us, um, the qualification to be a leader was um, just taking a step towards finding solutions to and through waste. And, and for us, a leader doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and at any point in their lives or professions. And um, as you know, you might know that no single community or person has a monopoly on leadership. Uh, and all you need is to be able to wish to make change. And uh, if not for our work, most of this information would have uh, stayed immobilized or landfill in lengthy PDFs um, without any use to anyone, or all of this information would have been limited to expensive international conferences. So um, we're extremely happy about the impact we've been creating, but um, this is just a drop in the ocean compared to the scale of challenges we face, which, uh, which are all planetary. Um, for example, climate change, public health, or um, plastics, um, plastics pollution in the oceans. Now, um, our generation, we have our battles to fight. Uh, we'll have many heroes, successes, and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those um, who are not ready yet, um, take your time. And when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you take the next step. And I'll be here to help in any other way possible. Now, coming to uh, Be Waste Wise activities, um, in, in addition to the Global Dialogue on Waste, which happens every year, we also publish um, the Waste Pioneers list. It's a list of uh, organizations and individuals who are doing amazing work with social media, who are doing very good work in sharing their stories on social media. And uh, once the list is published, we also um, organize uh, Q&A sessions with them and interviews with them. Um, so those are also published. Please check them out. Um, and um, we also have a, a weekly interview series with uh, the individual waste pioneers coming up soon. So um, stay stay um, sub subscribe um, to our newsletter and uh, follow us on social media so that you're updated. And um, for for any of you who are listening in, if you if you uh, if you were a contributor to Be Waste Wise, if you were a panelist at some point, um, uh, we run something called the community newsletter. So we uh, if you have any updates, if you have any articles, if you have any uh, work uh, related achievements, share them with us, and then we'll share them with the uh, com with our community. Um, and uh, finally. Um, I've been um, seeking actively. Uh, I've been actively seeking employment, and while I was doing that, I realized that there is no single platform or single place where we could um, find uh, we could find good opportunities in waste management and international development in waste management. So, uh, because of that, we thought you know we would just add one more drop in the ocean by um, asking you to send us uh, any job opportunities you have, so that we can share them on our LinkedIn group and also share them through our newsletter with everyone so that they have a uh, better chance uh, of getting all of this news in, in one place. So um, <clears throat> finally, coming to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, we have about um, 310 registrations for all four um, um, days combined. So uh, we're extremely happy about this. Um, this is. Uh, uh, thank you for, for um, joining us. And um, in addition to this, we also have uh, three viewing sessions. So these are people from around the world who, you know, get their friends and um, colleagues together to watch these um, sessions together and also have a group come together um, with the Global Dialogue on Waste as an occasion. And uh, today we have um, uh, Narsinga Pani Grahi from uh, Bhubaneswar, Orissa in India. Um, he organized a viewing session uh, with his uh, friends and colleagues, um, and uh, he represents uh, uh, an organization called SDRC and SGR. And SDRC works on uh, um, so social issues, and uh, SGR works on recycling in uh, in, um, in 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 Orissa. And he got um, other friends and colleagues who are interested in circular economy and waste management. And they're they're watching this live, and they'll be able to submit their questions to us uh, while while we're during the session. So, 
with all of that, um, today we have uh, Brian McCarthy with us, um, and uh, he he's an independent consultant. He also works with RWA Advisors. And uh, in today's session, we'll be covering the types of challenges practitioners like him who are in the, at the front line face. And, um, and we'll also understand why and how they choose certain paths or take certain decisions. And um, we believe instead of just knowing what certain countries do or practitioners do, for example, they do so-and-so technologies or they do so-and-so um, methodologies, instead of just knowing what, we believe it's much more useful to others, other practitioners in waste management to understand why and how these practitioners take those decisions. So um, with that, I welcome uh, Brian to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Hi, Brian. Uh, welcome. Hello, Ranjith. Thanks for your introduction and uh, thanks very much for your contribution to the Global Waste Management uh, Challenge. I've got to congratulate you and the Be Waste Wise uh, initiative. Um, I think it's a fantastic initiative to share and disseminate knowledge, which is uh, really important. And as you say, a lot of information is tied up within uh, PDFs and various computers around the world and never really get disseminated to the, the real people in the field that need to know it and need to work with it. So congratulations. Great initiative. Um, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, so um, uh, starting with the, um, today's um, session, so can you tell tell everyone a little bit about your work, you know, how you got into this and what kind of work you're doing right now? And, you know, what drives you? You, you, you know, you, you spend quite a bit of time on the field. So what drives you? Yeah, so I got into waste management, I guess, I guess going way back to when I was a young boy. My father worked for uh, large container ships, shipping companies. He was a, a civil uh, chief engineer on some of the largest container ships in the world. So, uh, and I used to sail with him um, from Britain to Hong Kong and uh, through um, the Mediterranean, Suez Canal, around India, and stopping off at all these ports around the world. And I guess that really inspired my introduction to the living environment and, and um, our our human interactions with the environment and trade and global trade and globalization um, which is really where a lot of our waste management challenges come from is waste is a, a byproduct of consumption and uh, the global production and consumption and globalization is really um, pushed um, our production to a level in which our waste production is at levels never seen before. Um, so at a very young age, I got introduced to the very tight um, living environment of a ship and what the waste and, and, and the services within a small community living as an island in the ocean for months at end. But then stopping at these huge cities, huge ports, and seeing the global trade and the and the different levels of municipal development within the, each of these, and then over years seeing the development in Kuala Lumpur, in Chennai, and in, in various uh, ports that we stopped at, and Hong Kong, um, and uh, and that spurred me on to go to university, study environmental engineering and science, and. Uh, and then after university, I got um, compulsory mobilized with the military to go to Iraq, um, where after initial uh, months with the, as a, a traditional military role, I got put in charge of waste management, given my background in Basra. Um, because with the fall of the Ba'athist regime and the sanctions, the UN sanctions that were on uh, Iraq at the time, prior to the 2003 invasion, um, suddenly these sanctions were lifted and we got this huge influx of trade into a society that was previously very much self-sustaining and thus very little consumption, new consumption, new uh, goods coming in in which to produce the waste uh, or, or uh, become waste. And so suddenly you got this huge influx of waste into the society, into the cities and, and a huge influx of wealth, uh, monetary uh, influx as development aid was pushed into the cities and the country as a whole. And so we saw a dramatic, a, a, a drop of um, waste production um, during the 2003 invasion, but then a sudden very rapid climb in waste production as consumption increased. Um, and so I, I was 
uh, kind of put in charge of um, developing a strategy for the south of Iraq, which was picked up. And I eventually I spent about five years in Iraq in different locations and different levels, working with municipal um, officials and rebuilding their capacity, um, as well as the, 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 the institutional capacity, as well as the technical capacity to deliver services, um, which is vitally important in stabilizing a, a, a fragile state. Um, if the, the majority of the population are not at war, they are living their normal lives. And if they do not have a safe and clean environment in which to bring up their children and to live their lives, then the, the uh, society can break down and, and resent and, and run against the government. So it's a very important aspect of a stable society is having this clean municipal environment. So that's really where my beginnings uh, were. Then I went on to Sweden and did my uh, master's in environmental management and policy at Lund University and uh, subsequently worked in Britain and for a consultancy in Britain uh, for a couple of years before returning to Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And I did about uh, roughly uh, almost five years in Afghanistan working on similar issues. Um, very exciting. Uh, people ask me, oh, God, you, it, it must be bad working in Iraq, Afghanistan during war. But like I say, society is still functioning in, in war-torn areas and, and fragile states. And, and the majority of the people want nothing more than a stable environment in which to bring their families up and, and in which to live. And so working with those people was just fantastic. And um, one of my colleagues from the project in, in Iraq, a USAID funded project in Kandahar. My colleague is now, a local colleague, is now the mayor of Kandahar and really driving forward a lot of um, the work that we did in terms of waste management municipal service delivery there. And that's very rewarding to see um, a colleague go on and move on to a position of real influence in the community. Um, and since then, uh, so I finished there in 2000. Uh, 14, I guess, or 2013-14, and uh, since then I've mainly been working on the African continent, um, South Africa, Ethiopia was the first major project, and similar challenges, um, transitional economies, um, so not strictly war-torn, but very um, transitional and, and rapidly, economically rapidly growing, and as a result, um, waste production rapidly growing, and um, the capabilities, both technological um, and institutional and financial capabilities to deal with that rapid growth in waste production uh, rarely exists in transitional economies. So working with them to build that, very rewarding. Again, it's not like working in Europe where it's quite confined. The rules and regulations are already there, so you've got very little room to to devise something new and innovative. There are, there is ways, definitely, there's still innovative uh, innovations going on in Europe, but when you've got a black blank canvas on which to work with, it's uh, a little bit more exciting and um, rewarding, I guess. You see quite dramatic changes rather than having to wait the long time to see it slowly pass through the bureaucratic systems. So yeah, so recently we've been working in uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, um, Zimbabwe, um, also in Europe and Albania, um, we had a big tour uh, project there, and in U uh, Cyprus, in which we are working with an EU pro funded program to try and bring up northern Cyprus, uh, which is officially part of Europe, um, but governed um, autonomously, um, right. bringing them up to European standards. So that's where we are at the moment. Right. Um, so uh, I think we can just say that you're uh, much more adventurous than most of us um, working in the sector. Um, and um, um, one thing you observe, which is, um, you know, you uh, get uh, wealth and trade first and then waste management increases. I, I mean, we've seen this um, all over the world, you know, um, when it's important to uh, address poverty. And once we start addressing poverty through, you know, trade and growth, then um, it, it, that during that time, when we are addressing poverty, we need um, infrastructure like water, um, roads, and you know energy. 
But then with some lag, once the trade kicks in, then we see waste management increasing. So the need for waste management increasing. So um, it's an interesting, but I think in the areas that you work in, um, I think it's much more uh, rapid um, in, in conflict ridden zones or in, in underdeveloped. So uh, in un underdeveloped uh, economies. So um, so this, this would have really given you a good um, view at uh, what kind of impact uh, uh, foreign aid uh, that's put in a certain um, area has on the local uh, infrastructure, local waste management infra infrastructure. And um, this is something we've been talking um, about earlier. So uh, do you think you can um, tell us a little bit about what kind of impacts uh, foreign aid has on local infrastructure, how it impacts in, in, in good ways and bad ways? Yeah, definitely. I've Foreign aid is an incredibly difficult topic, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of uh, research and, and, and opinions about whether foreign aid, where it should be directed, how much should be directed where, um, and, and when it should be delivered and when it should be cut off. Um, it, it's a very difficult um, topic, but um, so, so we have different aspects of foreign aid. We have um, just general international development and, and, and themed aid, so, so where aid is specifically targeted to develop um, waste management or municipal services, or where it's targeted as the economic growth or stabilization initiatives. Um, so th th they have different impacts. I think all foreign aid um, influences the local economy, which as a result influences the, the, the money circulating on the local economy, which impacts how much waste is produced and in general increases the waste that is produced and, and changes the type of waste that's there as the economy grows, as, as aid um, uh, aid finances are channeled to different areas. You can see examples uh, if there's a water shortage or a water problem, uh, aid can often come in the form of, of physical water bottles. And so you see a huge explosion of the amount of plastic there. And then when the aid cuts off, the plastic is no longer there. And so you, you have this um, huge um, residual um, material to deal with, but it's not a sustainable business uh, a sustainable business can't be set up to deal with that waste stream because it's only a very um, short piece of period of time in which that um, material is is put onto the market and becomes waste. But I guess it, focusing on where aid is focused on waste management, we see a lot of aid focused on um, Assisting, I mean, if, if I go around Ethiopia, um, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, Eth Egypt, Iraq, all those, Albania, um, all those countries, and, and indeed Cyprus, all those countries have received aid in the way of a loan or a grant to establish um, um, sanitary landfill sites. Um, and, and it's it's a push, I think, partly driven by the UN and, and, and potentially the sustainable development goals are really driving this. Um, sustainable goal 11 on uh, improving waste ma uh, municipal services into cities. Um, we see a lot of, a lot of aid money f focused on growing aid, the, the, the Aid agencies or the, the donor agencies or the, the national agencies come in and they, they look at the environment, they look at the city, what do you need? Oh, we've got a dump site that's burning. And they say, okay, well, our environmental policy says that you should have, uh, uh, our, our aid can only be spent on um, items that are within our environmental policy terms. So that generally means a sanitary landfill means a geomembrane, a full, uh, fully lined um, sanitary landfill with leachate treatment system, uh, generally a mechanized leachate treatment system, but not always, but quite often that there's a, a discharge limit um, and that is tied into the aid bodies um, environmental policy. 
so, 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 so something that they're in my uh, or, or their um, decision makers can support because you know that's what fits their environmental policy. Uh, so yeah. they would say that you would have to um, convert your open dump site, which is burning, into something like this, so that we can support you. Yeah. So for yes, exactly. Um, so an example would be in in Afghanistan and Kandahar when I was there. Uh, it was a municipal a municipal development program, so it was involved in all municipal services and uh, all aspects of municipal uh, institutional and technical. But one of the biggest problems was that the waste was being dumped in the dry river bed in Kandahar and, and other um, cities in the area. But I'll choose Kandahar as the biggest city in the south in the area I was working. And the USAID uh, was the donor agency. Their environmental policy says for a landfill to be built, you need to have a full environmental impact assessment by a third party. And it has to comply with US EPA standards. And that's what we were told was the requirement if we wanted to do a landfill. So we couldn't, we we needed a place to take the waste to 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 in, to teach the municipality. Okay, the waste doesn't get dumped in the dry riverbed. It has to go into a designated place, uh, a, a properly controlled disposal site. But the municipality couldn't fund a landfill and couldn't establish another facility without our assistance they just didn't have the financial means um, and we couldn't build a, a sanitary landfill because we just didn't have the funds a third party capable of doing a full EIA would have cost far more than the actual physical construction of the landfill because the capacity didn't exist in Afghanistan to do an EIA and, and to bring one in with all the security and everything just would have been ridiculous. So we had to be innovative. And, um, and so we, instead of building a sanitary landfill or a landfill, we built a transitional waste accumulation site. So we just changed the name and said it's transitional in nature because of the composition of the waste. It's very organic. We're going to build a semi-aerobic uh, transitional accumulation site for the waste to accumulate um, and basically it was a semi-aerobic landfill but with the idea that the waste will decompose quickly and it can be mined and and, uh, and converted into compost at a later stage um, and therefore um, get around these rules but other places we can't get around those rules um, we were I was again in Iraq at the end of last year um, in the northern Iraq in, in Kurdish area and there there was a dump site on fire uh, so so um, uh, aid money had established a mechanical and biological treatment facility with a sanitary landfill uh, beside it uh, incredible expense 19 million euros or so and um, the sanitary landfill, which cost its, itself about seven million, um, had had been on fire. They just they, they hadn't had the, the capacity, the skill set to um, to operate the landfill in accordance with uh, the needs of that site. And the waste had gone on fire, and the the, the liner had burnt out. So all that money had been wasted. But beside it, most of the waste was still going to a dump site that was on fire. And during that time, another um, national aid uh, agency came along and said, we want to support you. Um, what can we do? They said, well, the dump site's on fire. Um, it's producing a lot of leachate also. We've also got the sanitary landfill and we want to improve its management and start using it. But it had already been burnt out. The liner had gone. I, it was the majority of the waste was in the dump site. But this aid agency, um, within its environmental policy, couldn't do anything that was out with of their environmental policy. So their um, assessment identified the need for treating the leachate from the sanitary landfill. And so they spent another 2 million euros establishing a reverse osmosis uh, leachate treatment plant because that was the only system that could meet their environment, the aid agency, I won't name that, the aid agency's um, environmental standards for discharge wow. limit. And so another 2 million in aid 
mm. to waste, which can be which is proportioned to the waste or municipal services sector of that nation's aid uh, receipt is wasted. The reverse osmosis is will never be sustained because it's <clears throat> is an expensive t treatment. They didn't have the, the the finance to maintain the landfill as it was, right? And right. so, introducing this additional expense of operating and maintaining a reverse osmosis plant was just ne is never going to be sustained, right? But right. this aid is is tied. This aid agency is tied to the environmental policy of the, their national standards. So that's a case where aid is a, the politicians can stand up and say we have received or we have spent this amount of money on uh, the municipal infrastructure and waste management to assist it but it's complete waste and right, right. I see so many instances of this and and so that's that's kind of aid wasted similarly around the world we see um, the national level politicians saying, okay, we need sanitary landfills in every city. So, um, Brian, Brian, yeah. Yeah. I want to um, talk about that and also mention the Ghazipur landfill site. Um, so um, as I think that that's uh, very much related to, you know, what you're going to talk and also talk a little bit about the CAPEX and OPEX, you know, you get foreign aid for CAPEX, but not, you know, for the OPEX. So let's yeah. talk about that. But uh, let me just um, remind um, everyone who's viewing that um, you're watching the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. And this is uh, Practicing Waste Management. We have Brian McCarthy with us. And um, we also have a viewing session where um, Narsingh Apani Grahi from SDRC and SGR, um, he's gotten a bunch of his friends and uh, colleagues to watch it. And they'll be able to um, submit questions here. And um, you can also uh, submit your questions by using the question and answer box below the screen. And uh, um, depending on how much time we have, we'll, uh, we'll you know, try to answer all of them. And um, so, uh, Brian, um, you know about the Ghazipur uh, landfill site um, disaster, which happened just this week. And um, when something like this happens, then there's a, a, always an outcry from the public and from media and from politicians, you know, who are trying to, uh, you know, politicize it. Um, there's a, a cry for, you know, better waste management techniques and then to uh, to jump from uh, open dump to something much more advanced. I think this is something that we'll be talking with Andy in the next 45 minutes. But, you know, there's a huge demand for to do something like that. So which is slightly different from what you've been talking where, you know, the aid agency has uh, certain restrictions, but then here it comes from public and, you know, from within the country. Um, so um, in such cases, you know, um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, how do you deal with it as a practitioner? You know, how, how are you supposed to think about this? Um, yeah, so um, mega cities are a very difficult uh, problem. The waste management in mega cities is, is an incredibly difficult problem. but similarities between dump sites in uh, Delhi to to dump sites in a secondary city, a smaller city in, uh, in Zimbabwe, where the economy is restricted. Many of the, the problems come from dump sites are, are relatively or are very cheap to to run and operate uh, or to, to as a, a very cheap disposal route for cities and because they are so cheap financially cheap not not economically because the economic impact is actually huge but it's not um accounted for in the finances locally um because they are financially cheap to operate it means that nothing can really compete with them so recycling or or um Advanced. We will. You will speak. You'll speak later with Agri Protein and and um, Christian Chris Zuber uh, on uh, the Black Fly, Black Soldier Fly, um, evolving or, or or emerging techniques for dealing with uh, the various waste streams. They can't compete with open dumping or dump sites because it, they cost. There's a cost associated with establishing the capital investment cost, the operational cost. Whereas dump sites are just too cheap, 
and and I think it's a problem with municipalities and governments just not allocating appropriate funding for the or or not uh, enforcing um standards at these dump sites i actually think a lot of dump sites are actually an asset to to towns especially emerging economies in emerging economies the dump site shouldn't be seen as all bad it should just be incrementally improved through um enforcing um operational standards that would be expected on a sanitary landfill anyway and this is why i have a big problem with international aid just going in and establishing sanitary landfills without first saying right you prove to us that you can operate the dump site that you have to a standard which if you have it a sanitary landfill will be required to establish it because there's so many millions of euros dollars invested into sanitary landfills around the world and they just fall into disrepair fall into disposal sites very rapidly because the skill set and the, the operational financing is not there so i think this is the same as as happened um in the gazipur landfill is it there's just not the the, the operational financing and and the 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 strategic thinking of looking beyond uh, to the next step and just seeing it as a cheap way and overloading it with waste because it is a cheap way of disposing of the waste that causes the problems we've got and it means because it's cheap because we don't invest in the enforcement of investment in the operation and maintenance of these facilities nothing else can compete so our black soldier fly can't compete our recycling industries can't compete our biogas can't compete nothing can compete with the cheapness of this and so you get these sites overfilled and then collapse the same happened in addis ababa 170 people killed last the beginning of this year um and it's just happening more and more often because these sites are just getting overloaded because they're so cheap as a waste disposal mechanism. And then people stand up and say, oh, well, we need waste to energy. It's not a solution. I think waste to energy is, is push, sweeping the problem under the, the carpet, as it were. Um, again, you, who's going to pay for the finance, the operational finance of that? But also it doesn't address our overproduction and overconsumption of unsustainable materials that become waste so quickly. If you have waste to energy, you're, uh, the EPR schemes and the, the, the systems we have in Europe in which we have a large, Sweden is often seen as the best country for or a shining light for waste management in the world, the, some, uh, the utopia, but really it does, the systems we have here in Europe and, and uh, they do nothing to stop the increase in unsustainable products entering the market that quickly be, and packaging in particular epr schemes that address packaging they do nothing to really change the the material and the, the amount the volumes of waste that are entering the market and it's not an op it's not a solution. We have to really go back to the manufacturing, go back to where does the waste come from? And I think that's something that the circular economy is trying to address, going to try and address. Um, um, but will it? Has, is it going far enough to address the real um, economics of the entire global uh, consumption and production, production and consumption? I right, don't right. think it does. Right. right. Um, uh, we have a question here. Um, uh, Brian, can you mute, mute yourself just for just one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we have a question here from um, Harijan Das. And um, I think what he's asking is, um, so uh, when you're working in conflict um, zones, I mean, are you worried about the amount of land that's used for landfills? Um, and if you are or you're not, you know, what kind of steps can be taken in such situations to reduce the amount of waste that's going to the landfill? That's a good question. Um, the amount of land that's going, uh, this really is geographically um, 
dependent on where you are. Iraq has a fantastic amount of land, and I guess, yeah, there there is there, there's definitely an issue with the land taking up, and that's why I think this dump sites, existing dump sites, are an asset um, in many situations because they have traditionally not been managed properly. And so they take up a large area of land and that land has already been contaminated and already been um, uh, it, it devalued. It's not a valuable resource uh, in terms of uh, economic building um, infrastructure. Um, and so that land can then be used more efficiently as a controlled landfill. And that's where I think we should begin our uh, remediation and, and, and uh, improvements in disposal systems. Um, we can't move directly from uh, dump sites to, to re uh, very efficient recycling or, or uh, advanced waste treatment technologies because it's just free. You're fighting against, a, 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 you're comparing a free disposal system versus a, a, a cost um, uh, base system. So the, the, yeah, the, it really is geographically dependent. Iraq had a lot of land. Afghanistan, southern Afghanistan had a lot of land, but then there's other areas that had a lot of um, cities. Kabul was lacking land. It's in a valley or in a basin, um, surrounded by mountains. And so access to land is a lot more precious, but that should stimulate um, other waste management systems. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, energy from waste incineration. We'll see the black soldier fly later. I think the majority of waste in developing countries is organic and thus um, we should put more emphasis on the enforcement of separation of wet waste or the organic stream versus the other streams and uh, make that a priority rather than uh, investing heavily in infrastructure, invest heavily in uh, enforcement and then hopefully um, economics, free market economics dictate that uh, the private sector should take over if the enforcement of those separation is performed. All right, all right, that sounds good. So, uh, so we, we have another uh, seven minutes. minutes. So, uh, uh, we we remark some suggestions for uh, decision makers worldwide, uh, you know, how they could solve these problems that, you know, we um, you know, talked about. Sorry, say that again. Um, so um, we have uh, another seven minutes. So do you have any suggestions or, you know, um, solutions? Uh, oh, um, Brian, actually, uh, there was another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which was the game that you were developing. Um, so um, I know you were using this game um, for um, engaging uh, decision makers in workshops to make them understand, you know, how they could build their own waste management system. So. I thought it was really interesting when you told me about this. So, can you tell us a little bit? Do, uh, do you have anything to show? Um, Ooh, um, that's a good good point. Normally, I do. Uh, okay. I'll do my best. Uh, so, what I have, I'll explain it, <laughs> and then hopefully, I'll remember where I put them. Um, what we have is, we find that in many instances, um, decision makers, there's a whole, the, all the stakeholders. Um, in the waste management system don't often have full vi visibility of what is available to them to manage the waste. And that includes from, from the very basics of um, a wheelie bin versus a, an open uh, metal bin. Um, and um, we also have decision makers, mayors uh, and, and national politicians go on study tours to Europe see oh everybody's got a wheelie bin so we want a wheelie bin at every door in our city in the middle of i don't know um ethiopia the secondary city and they don't see okay the 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 um logic the, the 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 steps that then are required you know a wheelie bin needs to be compatible have a compatible truck to lift it into its truck. Otherwise, these guys are struggling with a big wheelie bin to throw it into the back of an open van. So what we developed was the we started to put together what we call the waste management, waste collection and treatment almanac, which is a, a book or a, a yeah a book of all the different uh, waste collection 
bin types, uh, vehicle types, primary collection vehicle types, secondary collection vehicle bit types, um, secondary um, transfer stations, um, uh, recycling technologies, and just identifying, you know, where's the manufacturers of these equipments, how much is the capital cost, how much is the operational cost, and what other resources are really required. And from that, we, we then developed a card game. And uh, if I can think where I've put the cards, um, we have small cards of each of these technologies. Uh, so from a bin, all the different bin types, all the uh, different primary collection. And we range these, you know, um, there's a huge range we have, um, but then we make them appropriate to the country we're building the capacity in. So, right. you know, a, a bicycle, pedal bicycle collection may not be appropriate for, um, for Sweden, uh, but it's appropriate for Delhi. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we, we adjust it to the local context. Yeah. And so we have in the stakeholder workshop, they build their system from bin, bin types based on their waste uh, categorization analysis. Uh, and then they build their system um, right the way through to disposal or treatment. And then they have to cost up the capital cost and the operational cost. Uh, very basic, quick, easy, very visual, what, what equipment's available, what would they choose, what's compatible with what, and then we analyze it. Is this compatible with this? And then they begin to realize, okay, this, is, um, this isn't compatible, this isn't the right, this isn't appropriate for our city or our town, so we'll change that out and make it more affordable. And at the end, they have to cost up the op OPEX and the CAPEX uh, and, and compare it to their available budget. So it's a very quick and easy, very visual and very, um, user uh friendly and, and uh, yeah collaborative right uh, stakeholder dialogue and it says it's been a lot of fun we've we've done it in probably about 10 countries now and every workshop's really enjoyed it all right all right great uh, brian we have a quick question from uh Pavan Jadav, and um he's asking um so for a country like india what would be the best method to collect and treat the leachate from a dump site uh, yeah, India is a difficult one because it's quite um, quite uh, organic waste, uh, hot. Um, uh, well, depending, I mean, India has got such a huge uh, various. But um, generally, you know, if you can go for a low cost biological system, um, if you have the land available, then um, oxidation ponds can be very good um, uh, into a. a, a, a um, active um, reed bed or a, um, a, yeah, reed bed system. Um, but um, yeah, it, it really depends on what expertise exists in the place, in your uh, local uh, e economy. So if reverse osmosis is, is a very good um, way of treating leachate, it's, it's very effective. But if you do not have a supply chain of membranes to replace and, and uh, maintain the skill set to maintain reverse osmosis, then it's totally useless. But if you do have that skill set in the town and in, in the local economy, then it's go for that. Um, it's really dependent on what is appropriate um, in your market. And, and I would have to do a, a local market analysis to see what is is um, available to see which is the most appropriate. Right. I think that's what you would do. Yeah, um, um, that might not uh, seem like an answer to uh, you know people who are asking, but I think that's what it all comes down to. You have to analyze the local situation and uh, and what Brian said about absorption ponds. I think that that works in India. And uh, one more question, um, just uh, just before you leave, uh, we don't have any more time, but if you can quickly answer this with a yes or no, uh, Rohit Nagar Golj um, asks. While it is true that uh, waste energy plants are not sustainable, at least as far as incineration is concerned, do you think they provide a stepping stone solution for countries like India? Because you know there are so uh, some certain converging factors in mega cities. I mean, do you think it, it acts as a stepping stone? I mean, with a yes or no, and then I think we can. End I it. think there's a, there's places appropriate. Yeah, waste energy is appropriate for some places. Yeah, definitely. Um, whether uh, yeah. Because it does put a cost on the waste, and so as long as it's a, a free market 
cost that other technologies can compete with. It's the contract terms that really affect the sustain the, the, the whether it's a stepping stone or not. How the contract managed is managed and the clauses and right the now, when you the contract you're you're talking about the length of the term and you're also talking about how powerful the corporation is or how powerful the yeah, the, the payment mechanisms, the length of time, the amount of waste that's guaranteed to go into the site, um, uh, whether they can remove, re who owns the waste and at what stage it becomes their ownership. I think that's the critical part of whether waste energy can act as a stepping stone or mm -hmm. whether it will be a, a inhibit future alternative uh, developments from establishing. Right, because great. there really are a lot of alternatives coming on the market. And if you want an innovative uh, sector, waste management sector, you can't have all your waste tied up for a 20 year contract to one incineration plant. Right, okay, with, with that, um, I think um, we should um, go on, uh, move to the next session. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Brian, uh, for joining right. us. And uh, I hope you'll check the other sessions out and i um, looking forward to um, having you, you know, talking to you again at some point. Definitely. Thanks, Ranjith. Thanks, Thanks for listening to my ramblings. <laughs> Take care. No worries. Have a good one.